Welcome to this short series all about problems with model steam engine reversing valve gear. Dismantling the valve gear to set the slide valve timing correctly. The assembly process is shown in my series Making a Stuart Model Steam Plant. This engine is a Stuart 110V, a very popular engine. They've been around for many years and when they're built correctly they work fine. This one is built up from a factory machine kit so there's nothing wrong with it at all. Except for the usual problem. The slide valve was not a good fit on the crossbar, it was too tight, which held the slide valve off the ports. And this combined with the fact that the face of the slide valve itself hadn't been cleaned up, meant that most of the air was blown to exhaust. That was a quick fix. By filing the slot a bit wider in the slide valve itself and cleaning up the face of it. As you can see by the label on top of the engine, which has been there for quite a while, this is a D10 reversing gear machine kit. I carefully assembled this valve gear, but I had problems with things lining up. I covered the assembly of the valve gear and the problems that I had with it in episodes 25 to 28 in the series Making a Stuart Model Steam Plant. No sooner had I fitted the valve gear to the engine, it was time to remove it to set the valve timing, because the engine would not run both ways. The first part of the job is to remove the bolts, remove the bracket, Poke out the die block using the end of my scriber. Here it is sat on the scriber so you can see what it is. Just a piece of brass tube. And now by rotating the flywheel to change the position of the expansion link, I'm able to rotate the valve rod to alter the position of the valve rod relative to the slide valve in the cylinder. You can actually do this one turn at a time until you get it right. But it's far easier to remove the valve gear entirely so you can see whereabouts the slide valve is positioned in the steam chest. Removing the parts from the other end was quite simple, but not so simple at this side. I had to slacken off the eccentric sheave, and that was so I could move the bracket away from the steam chest. This proved to be a very fiddly job, mainly because the two rods that pull the expansion link back and forth are locked tighted onto the shaft. In the end it was so fiddly I used my small proxon blowtorch to heat up the joints of the outer rod so I could remove it. Because with the rod in position I couldn't get to the bolts properly. I must admit that these link rods that move the expansion links back and forth do look quite nice. Once I'd removed the steam chest covers I was in a position to see whereabouts the slide valves were in the steam chest when I rotated the crankshaft but first of all I need to put the parts back together. This involves measuring the thickness of the steam chest cover, which is an eighth of an inch. Then I can turn up some spacers that are one eighth of an inch thick to allow me to successfully fit the reversing gears mounting brackets. It's a very simple plain turning and drilling job. After facing across the end of the bar to square it off, first of all I drill it with a centre drill, followed by using a twist drill that is clearance size for a 7BA stud. Then all I have to do is part off seven pieces of the brass bar that are one eighth of an inch thick. I'm setting the parting tool just using a ruler at one eighth of an inch in. It's quite easy to make four one eighth of an inch thick spacers because they don't need to be absolutely 100%, only 99.9. .9. When I got to the last one, I had to pull the piece of brass out of the chuck a little bit more. Otherwise, as I parted off the piece of brass, the parting tool holder would have hit the chuck jaws. After rummaging about in the chip tray I found all four of the parts which makes a change and after cleaning them up on a piece of wet to dry sandpaper I just fit them to the engine as shown. After which I can start to refit the reversing gear starting with this bracket. I did the same at the other end and loosely fitted this bracket as well. Nothing was binding and everything was in the right position so it was a simple job to tighten the bolts to hold the bracket securely against the steam chest for the next part of the operation. And for that I turned the engine round and tightened the nuts on the bracket at the other end. So now the reversing shaft and the reversing arm, as well as the expansion links, are all now in the right position so I can carry on with the job. To fit the locking mechanism in place, I just used the steam chest cover, fitted the wrong way round and mounted it back on there. In the design of this valve gear, the locking bar is supposed to be hung from an extended stud, the one in the bottom left hand side of the steam chest. 
At first I couldn't figure out how this was not going together as it should have done. But after a short phone call with Andy at Stuart Models, he did say there were some problems with the early issues of this valve gear and he was going to send me another part, but I didn't need it. I prefer it the way I've done it. I really don't like to see things hung from studs because it just looks like an afterthought. When the steam chest cover is refitted the correct way around, I think this looks all right. Here I'm going to show why I removed this crossbar. My nut spinner just would not fit. This clip shows reassembly with the crossbar removed and it makes the whole job a lot easier to do. You will notice that I've turned down the diameter of the end of this nut spinner because it was always a bit big and in no time at all the die block was refitted to the valve fork. This is the side of the engine where the reversing lever is and I'm currently refitting the locking mechanism. Now it's time to get ready to set the timing. The job starts by tightening the grub screw that holds the eccentric sheave onto the crankshaft. I always use an initial setting of as near as I can get it to 90 degrees to the crank pin. The whole idea of this procedure is to make sure when I rotate the engine the valve moves equidistantly. This setting is not right, the valve isn't moving equidistantly, it's not in the middle as you can see by the position of the screw thread. So once again I remove the bolt that holds the die block in place then I can rotate the valve fork into a different position, which in turn moves the position of the valve. Here I'm double checking that the eccentric sheave is at 90 degrees to the crank pin, and it is. I am of course checking by eye, but that is really near enough. My eye is quite good at checking things like this. Once you've figured out the direction of rotation, and that's down to which side of the crank web, the highest point of the lobe of the eccentric is set to. Still at 90 degrees to the crank pin, but at the other side, this will reverse the direction of the engine. I would like the engine, I think, to run clockwise when the lever is at the bottom. This is something that I'm never happy about. The eccentric sheaves are pinned together. They usually have an offset against each other, but I don't like to do it this way. I much prefer individual adjustment for each of the eccentric sheaves. I'll show you how I do that in the next episode. For now, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.